Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is BQ. This is the Impact Lounge, Impact Wrestling first quarter review. We're talking about the first three months of Impact Wrestling of 2018. On the line, I have my man from the heel cast, Raven Effect. Raven, what's going on, man? We've been trying to do this for like two or three weeks, conflicting schedules as all hell, and now we're here talking together finally. I know, right? What's up, BQ? Thanks for having me on, man, for sure. No, I've been staying on the heel cast. Actually, like the past, I've finally been back. And uh, I know as soon as I come back, we get like way less views. Coincidence, probably not. Uh, but yeah, I've been sitting on there like BQ and I are going to be putting something out. I'm going to come on, do a show with BQ for like three weeks. And everybody's going to like, well, it's going to happen at some point. It's just, you know, so it's good to finally work out on a Friday night. It shows uh, the kind of wild lifestyle both of us are having. But it is what it is, man. I'm happy to do this. Hell yeah. Uh, why, don't, why don't you put over the uh, heel cast real quick? Um, I'm going to put the heel cast in the description of this video. So if you guys dig Raven Effect and you're not a subscriber yet, just look at the description here and uh, take you directly to the heel cast. So um, tell us a little about, about the heel cast. Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, I, I try and go by the RAV now. It's kind of like a, a tie up of Mickey Avalon, basically because I'm a little bit worried about getting sued and I have no money. But, uh, you know, we started. January 2016, uh, basically the first impact, four of us got together from uh, what was TNA Asylum .net or com at the time. Uh, myself and uh, the TNA dude, Wake Chambers and Old School Heel. Uh, kind of a struggler's first year, but uh, myself and uh, the impact dude now, or whatever the fuck he's called, uh, we're still there. And then we we just got a bunch of other people coming in, like uh, Hurl does it with us. We got Chef Kyle, who was on... Uh, uh bq show at first when they were still uh, under that uh, good old double j alias and uh uh let's see we got uh wrestling robert from robert does wrestling we got larkin from uh snm podcast and of course fk9 from straight shooting so uh, you know we talked impact has been a positive thing we were doing it just a little bit before bq was uh as soon as we saw them you know it was like finally someone else doing the positive spin on impact so bq and i know each other for a bit our show is terrible. It's about a lot of dick jokes and humor, uh, at least attempting to, where I normally suck at it, but it is what it is. But, uh, you know, we go over wrestling, the news, plugs, uh, stories, all of that. We just put out a redemption preview. Uh, it's not our best show, so don't judge it off that one, but the prior ones before that are very good. I was listening to you guys on the way back from uh, WrestleCon, and there, you probably set a record for dick jokes that episode. I think that was the one where we actually had a... Uh, Larkin, come on! I think you guys called him on, and oh yeah, midway through the show. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was uh, yeah, that definitely had to have set the record for dick jokes or comments about dicks and porn. I can't remember if that was when we were just talking about porn constantly. Um, no, that was that was a couple weeks prior, but yeah, that show got a little out of hand. I had a lot of fun doing it, but it definitely got out of hand. Yeah, I was sitting here and uh, <laughs> I'm like, what in the hell are these guys doing? But no, the heel cast they do a good job and um, cover impact each week just like we do here on the lounge so definitely check them out and again in the description of this video if you're watching on youtube hit the link and uh, take you straight there to subscribe so we're talking about the first quarter of 2018 right now no jeff jarrett and um i think you were a lot like myself when jeff jarrett came aboard in 2017 that you actually i actually thought it was a good thing and i was uh felt it was gonna be a really positive thing were you, were you on that train as well Oh, yeah, bro. I was ecstatic, man. I mean, you know, the, my opinion, the best year or the best like period ever in TNA Impact history is 2006 to 2009. I mean, Double J Math probably went honestly, if you look at it, other than like, you know, when WWF bought out all the territories in like the 80s and all, I swear to God, I think this Impact roster at one time was the most talented roster of all time, other than like the 80s WWF, and that's Jarrett's spotting talent. Um, I mean, the man actually was making business growth while he was running the company, uh, not necessarily financially. I'm talking about, you know, like the roster and ratings jumping up and up slowly, but surely, um, of course, we know history took it that way. But, you know, when all those new talents came in, too, on top of it, because the roster had been paper thin, the talent we had been getting, I mean, when really like Mahabali, Shira, and Grado and shit like that, it, just, it, it wasn't uh, the talent that you wanted to see. So I was on board hardcore. So Jeff Jarrett um, left the company end of the year, and Don Callis and Scott Demore took over, and we're still in the first set of tapings. So they did about 12 episodes with this one, so we're still in that first set of tapings. But 
first of all, before we get into the first set of tapings, man, what did you think of Chris Jericho, of all people, kind of being that one that had the interest in saving impact? Um, I'm a, I'm a Jericho fan and you know, a lot of people know, I don't really care for WWE and I know you don't either, but Jericho was a guy I've loved for a very last, you know, very long time. And, uh, consider in my top three wrestlers of all time. In all honesty, absolutely love the dude. I check out his podcast. I was, I was surprised he was the one, even though he's always said he would, he watched impact, um, has never been shy of saying TNA on his podcast. What did you think of Jericho kind of being you know, the one of all people that, Wanted to see Impact succeed. Man, it shocked the shit out of me. To, I mean, it, it came. It was at a point where it felt like Impact was at, at the struggle again, and it wasn't getting any better with the new ownership. It felt just as, as sunken as Dixie Carter was. Um, and then, you know, you get someone with Jericho. I, I love Jericho, too, man. I've been a fan of him since uh, basically the start of WCW, when he his first heel turn, when he had Ralphus, when he was a man of a thousand and one holds. Uh, that's actually what I branded uh, the Impact due to the joke. Um, and for him to come out and, you know, support impact and give it that, like the blessing to stand behind Don Callis, who I've always been a fan of as well as when he was Cyrus, uh, in ECW. And from then on, uh, it was shocking. You know, I know he had worked with the new Japan ROH thing with Kenny Omega or whatever. I heard great things about that match. I just, I'm so like burnt out and like F you to the new Japan smarts that I, I can't watch it, but, um, (laughs) You know, he he always ends up going back to the WWE and all. New Japan getting hot, I just figured that was a one-time thing. But uh, it shocked me to hear it. But it's awesome. I think it's, I mean, ratings are coming up slowly. Uh, you don't hear as many impact jokes. So um, I think it helped out a little bit for sure. So what do you think about them overall? We're going to talk into a bunch of different things about the first quarter here. But how do you think they're doing as a whole, though? Because um, I, I for me, the very first episode i kind of felt a difference i mean there were subtle changes but it was enough where it seemed like they were cutting out the things that we don't like and the things that we complain about and for the most part every step episode in this set of tapings has been really solid i want to say there was a couple duds i actually didn't watch last night's um show prior to redemption because i wasn't home i heard it wasn't that good uh, i guess I'll, I'll judge for myself but do you think that the there's big a, been a big change in the in the programming, because I thought when Jarrett came back, I, I actually, I thought last year was awful. I mean, I, I try to be really positive on the channel and the, on the podcast, but I thought 2017 freaking sucked. But do you, do you think, I mean, do you feel a difference right now from, from last year? I do. It, it did kind of feel to me like when Jeff Jarrett came back in at the start of 2017, after like that for what was it like February, someone actually aired on TV. Am I right? Of last year. Yeah. Yeah. When Jarrett came on. Um, just to go back here real fast, I, I thought literally the first, when Jarrett first came over through Slammiversary, it was great. And I think Slammiversary last year was probably the best wrestling pay-per-view I'd seen in, in a long, long, long time. Agreed. But uh, after that, man, it just went to shit. It really did. And I agree with you there. And it, uh, at the end of last year, man, I was so just burnt out and just blah. I, I felt like I had no drive. Like, I had no, I had no like fucking positivity or like any light at the end of the tunnel with impact. And it just felt like this, the sink is, or the ship is going to sink and you know, it's going to be done for my wrestling fan. I was over with. And then, you know, the care, they take so much after bound for glory that it lasted into this year. And then, you know, I, I got excited toward the end. I wasn't excited, you know, like I, I normally am for tapings, but it was like, I'm excited to see what happens with this new regime, but how many more resets can we take? But man, these, these entire shows that they've done, I think, have been a drastic change. There's a different vibe to it, I think. Uh, obviously, with the ratings coming up, it seems to be that way. Uh, you know, man, um, yeah, unfortunately, probably with Alberto leaving or whatnot, last week's show, the uh, lead-in to Redemption, I, or last night, I feel like it did kind of fail. Uh, it definitely should have been better. They ended it with the main event from Lucha versus Impact Wrestling. And the show before it, as well, I actually was not that into. It got better praise than than uh, I thought it was good for prior to that. But I feel like every show after that was really good. And, you know, we have the heel cash chat that we talk about every day, which I bring up on our show sometimes. Um, man, it's like four or five, six weeks straight. I felt like I was watching a really good episode of Impact each week. And that's uh, how been able to say that in a long time. I totally agree. And uh, w- I think we're really on board. The, the end of the year, I was really burnt out too. And, you know, they did so many 
episodes after Bound for Glory, and you know, I got I started growing really tired of the green ropes. Even though for the Global Force shows they look cool, but for some reason on Impact looked like freaking crap, and I got really tired. And it happened last year. The usually Impact ends the year so so slowly. I mean, you think about before they debuted on Pop, and then the year where they had the Hardys, and they just kept doing Hardy specials, and then they do best of like the usually the end of the year absolutely sucks but one of the biggest changes they made coming on board this year in reference to Don Callis and Scott Moore was allowing the wrestlers to retain their intellectual property to maintain fluid agreements with the wrestlers to allow them to work anywhere they want and it rubbed a lot of fans the wrong way because the longtime fans wanted the longtime fans and, and you you've been a fan longer than me have you know have wanted exclusive I can't even say that word I struggle exclusivity they want exclusive wrestlers, exclusive contracts, but they, these guys are creating a new business model that puts the power in the hands of the wrestlers with certain limitations, of course. And they advised Ed Norholm to, this happened at the top of the year, to allow the Hardys to control their IP and have since licensed footage to WWE. And the two, those two companies are working together for the first time working on a project, which is the Hardys DVD. So this was really different than what Jeff Jarrett was doing. Jeff Jarrett was all about the intellectual property and you know, he was, he wanted those exclusive contracts and he wanted those exclusive gimmicks and everything. And that continued to make impact like a heel in the world of wrestling. So, uh, how do you think, uh, what, what's been your take on how this has worked? Because now obviously the Hardys are on WWE television. Um, we don't watch it, but you know, from, from what I know, it's not that good or not as good, but are, are you, now a few few months into the year like in agreeance that that was the right thing to do to allow the wrestlers to have their you know keep their gimmicks and all that you know what man i'm, I'm still not and yeah I, I mean it made uh ed nordholm kind of be the heel or impact be the heel with the exclusive rights that jeff jared talking about to wwe marks it, it's who it made it them the heel to because they will let them bring the broken gimmick to WWE. Let them do this in WWE. I want to see everything in WWE. Hey, when are you coming to WWE? That's like it, it, WWE does that shit with literally everyone. They they have trademarked people's fucking names. Like Cody Rhodes can't go like Cody Runnels or Cody Rhodes for Christ's sake, um, which, which is ridiculous. Cody Runnels is like his actual name, I believe. So it's uh, it, it was it was a double standard, which happens all the time, but. Here's my thing, man. Like, it's it's cool and it's probably going to, like, make some of the wrestlers happy. But EC3 is an NXT for one. Um, I just, I have trouble feeling like if you put EC3 and write a bunch of fucking lines for the guy in the script for some shitty writers, he's going to fail like he did the first time around. EC3 is probably going to trademark the name EC3 to the WWE. I won't, I don't know if it's going to work out because of, like, Impact's property on it. I would be surprised if they trademark Broken Matt Hardy with the WWE. I heard they actually trademarked Matt Hardy. I've heard they trademark, trademarked the name Eric Young, for Christ's sake. Um, you know, that that's the thing. And it's literally, it's only because of the enemy that I don't like this. I think it's cool, you know, like you see Bully Ray, apparently is in Ring of Honor going under Bully Ray. That sort of a thing. Um, you know, but I don't want to see, you know, Eli Drake come over. Uh, EC3 come over and trademark their names uh, over there at some point. Because... Who knows, man? Like, uh, literally, it, it came to the point where NXT to make you know minimal money or whatever is more appealing than to work to like work for Impact or Ring of Honor or something, and that sucks. I, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't know much about trademarks and copyrights. Uh, you know, I kind of go to school for business like that. That's <laughs> I've never really understood too much about that, and it's something I need to look into more. But I remember when Aries was there, they trademarked Austin Aries. And obviously he still uses that name on impact. So I don't put too much stock in, in trademarking when the person is under contract with him. Have you heard uh EC three's theme song, how shitty it is, his NXT one? I think I heard like a couple of lines from it. Like I didn't it say something like I'm a one percenter or something like that. I think it's something along those lines. It's um, cause I watched his entrance. It was a, uh, I don't know if it was on Facebook or Twitter someone recorded the entrance. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to check this out. And at first I thought it was cool. He's kind of pointing at the E, the C and the three. And then the music hit. I was like, dude, that's nothing compared to what he had at impact. Not even close. Yeah. I, I believe I saw the video too. I think it actually may have been from chef because chef went to NXT because chef turned heel and I hate it. But, um, it, was he jumping around and shit? That's what I, that's what I remember seeing. Like EC three jumping up and down. 
I uh, kind of over by what he was walking over by the guardrails or the fans or something. And it was just like, what on earth is going on? I don't, I don't think I remember seeing that. Yeah, it's. A, it, I mean, the song is stupid. And man, you can't beat trouble, 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 trouble. If you actually purchase the song, like you realize the song is actually pretty damn corny. But the whole trouble, trouble, trouble thing, the way it would catch on, the whoa, it's the impact zone. Uh, especially for that dead ass crowd, you know that that always got over. And it's just, I'm glad that they actually don't get to use that song in WWE or NXT. I'm really, I really am because fuck them. That's why. I'm gonna. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but we're talking about EC3 already. So, what what were your thoughts on him? him leaving because um you know for me personally i felt like he was really going through the motions towards the end and i mean if you if you i remember him on jim ross's show like two years ago before bound for glory and he was just mr tna all about it and then like you just hear him a year two later you know he starts oh yeah maybe i'll go back to nxt one day i got unfinished business like he starts dropping those and I don't know. I kind of got to the point, even though I love DC three with passion, I'm just like, man, I'm, I'm kind of ready for him to go. Like he wasn't really deliberate. Do you think, let me put it like this. Do you think it was him or it was the company? Because obviously he wasn't, they, they were not able to strike gold with him again. Like they did the first time. Do you think it was him or the, or like the booking of his character? I man, I think it goes all the way back to basically after his first loss, Actually, further than that, let's let's go back even further. When we were doing the Hillcast, when it was like pretty much going to be given, we're going to see EC3 face turn. I, I went adamant: do not do it. It's the wrong thing to do. I mean, you can't take a guy who's a spoiled brat millionaire, like one percent rich kid stuck up, saying it's it's working, it's fire, it, it's so great, and then change it. There's nothing babyface about it. Like you couldn't have made the million dollar man Teddy Biasi be a face. It doesn't work. Um, and you know, I I I say this on our own show sometimes too, but Household names in wrestling, I think there's about five or six that I would give it that. I mean, I think wrestling fans think a lot more guys are household names than they are. I think that EC3 had all of the talent in the world to be a household name. Like, and that's Goldberg, Hogan, Rock, Cena, uh, Austin, and uh, Andre the Giant. Like, that's kind of about it for me. Uh, there's some arguable ones, like probably Ric Flair. But, I mean, up in that upper echelon. After he lost to Bennett, you know, then he, uh, I believe he got pinned by Drew Galloway. Got pinned by Lashley, and it was like the mystique was gone. And they kept having the guy lose just so commonly. And, you know, it's like, um, I always say this, remember, every time Hulk Hogan lost, it was a big deal. Yeah. Okay. Every time Goldberg lost after history, it was still a big deal. EC3 was losing all the time. And then Jeff Jarrett comes in, and he's in a pissing match with Jeff Dixie Carter over a war he's already won. But it's like, there's a guy with the Carter name, and it just seems like they're burying him and putting him down on the card. Now, Slammiversary, when that happened, man, like, James Storm and EC3 was, like, my dream match for Impact. Those are my two guys. Was it second or third on the card last year? Yeah, I think it was third. I mean, give me a break. And then, you know, they just, they kept, he kept, kept getting pinned, man. I remember the, uh, like, the Triple H show where he, <laughs> I, I think he took the Pile driver from Phantasma, was that? <laughs> I was going to bring that up. He took it, and then, I mean, they started brawling outside of the ring for a good 30 seconds and then went and covered him. Yeah, and got the three count. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and he was, uh, I think, in the match that Impact won, he was like the weak link that was about to get pinned. Uh, I mean, I, I don't blame the guy. I feel like had they not ruined his character and booked him strong, like booked him the way that he should be to strike gold with it, Maybe we'd still see Ethan three or Ethan the Carter or Jesus man, Ethan Carter the third round. And you know I, I'm worried that they're doing the same with Eli Drake. I feel like Eli Drake was starting to surpass everything that EC three did because the characters are kind of similar, but it just they can't lose him either. But I think I feel like they lost the biggest opportunity that they could possibly have. And I feel like if WWE it won't happen because WWE the way that they do their programming with so much content and also the way that uh, they write the words for everyone, it'll never work out. But the worst thing I would hate to see would be WWE to get rich off this and just strike him and make him John Cena status. But then again, like I would be happy for EC3 too. So you brought up uh, Eli Drake. What, so he drops the title this year to Austin Aries. And I, I honestly thought they were going to give Eli Drake a title run like the entire year. I thought he was a guy that was going to break like the Bobby Roode record and everything. So I'm curious your thoughts on this actually, because you're an Austin Aries guy. So what do you think about like the whole title scene where Aries came in and won the title right away? 
if they're like, man, Eli Drake is my other like Aries and Eli are my guys, right? Like more than anyone on the roster. I, those are the two guys. If they leave, I don't know that I can like really be into the show anymore. Um, if there was anyone that I would approve in an Eli Drake's reign like that, it would be a double. Um, so I wasn't anti that, you know, I mean, he obviously beat him in seconds the first time around, but they had a good match afterwards. I, I did kind of feel like we'd see Eli Drake hold on to the belt till Slammiversary or, or Bound for Glory or something, then probably drop it to Moose or something like that. Um, but I wish they would have made a bigger deal and a bigger feud out of it. I feel like Eli deserved more, like he deserved better than that. Um, and I'm really, really, really cautious and concerned about how this new regime views the guy. But uh, it's, it's definitely, like, it's turned into great matches in A-double. His matches that he's had, like uh, Matt Seidel, Johnny Impact, uh, I'm trying to think of a couple others, but in this one that's going to happen at Redemption on Sunday, I mean, he put on some fantastic matches, which is something this company didn't have any of last year, at least for the most part. Yeah, not a single match. <laughs> there was, I want to say the last two years, they didn't have anything that was like match of the year worthy. I think the opening match of Slammiversary was, um, you know, the multi-man tag match. I actually thought that was our multi-team tag match, but I, I actually thought this year the Taya and Rosemary match has been the best match of the year. But what you, what were your thoughts on that one? Cause I haven't heard you guys, your you guys thoughts on it yet, but for me, for me, the first three ma- months of the year, that was my favorite match. You know, unfortunately we didn't get to actually cover that match because we uh, don't have enough time. So we just did the redemption preview show and didn't actually get to bring that up. And for some reason that's not going to be on the card. Apparently Rosemary's hurt, but um, I feel like for one, it should have uh, waited until redemption. To be honest with mm-hmm. you, but you know we, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. But I mean, look, man, the heel cast. The first person that kind of like really put us on the map is, is we got it. We saw. I noticed that Rosemary was like making comments, listening to our show, and uh, we struck it. We got an interview with Rosemary, and Rosemary right before she's like, "Hey, do you mind if I bring on Crazy Steve?" At this point, man, Crazy Steve has literally never talked on TV, and I'm like blowing my mind like dude we're gonna be the first people to ever get this guy to talk literally the impact beforehand he starts talking but i remember so, so man i've always been a rosemary guy um and i was happy to finally see her go over on taya because they've had taya get the best of rosemary pretty much every single time um it sucked at the what was it called the was it the red wedding match that was it's supposed to be bound for glory yeah i can't remember exactly what it's called yeah it sucks that we never got to see that especially at bound for glory and that entire card just fell apart <laughs> uh but man it was like they put Taya over so strong. It sucks that uh, we actually saw Allie pin Taya a couple nights before this match actually aired. Cause it would have been good to see Rosemary get her, like be the first person to actually beat Taya in impact. But uh, this definitely kicked ass for me. It's not my match of the year. My match of the year was uh Sammy Callahan versus Eddie Edwards. I quit match, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it definitely was up there, man. Well, even their one-on-one match they had on impact was really good. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, man. Yeah, they they got some they got some chemistry. Did you see that today that they announced? So yeah, Rose Rosemary's hurt. When I met Rosemary at an indie show last week or last month, she had her knee brace on, and she she it was a mixed tag match her and Steve against Robbie E and a local competitor, and it was pretty much a comedy match. Robbie E was you know kept running out of the ring and doing his bullshit, um, but Rosemary didn't take a single bump the whole match. She she actually barely wrestled in it. It was pretty much it was pretty much just comedy until S- Crazy Steve rolled up Robbie E. So I just don't think she's she's cleared yet. But did you know? Did you see today that they announced uh, a redemption? Taya is going to face Kira Hogan. I did. I like. I believe I saw. I think it was the Hillcast guys talking about that match, and I figured that that doesn't make any sense. Why is Kira Hogan going to wrestle Taya on the pay per view? Uh, did Robbie E. get his forty bucks from the indie promoter? I hope so. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, it doesn't make much sense. I mean, it's people are complaining about these random matches thrown together, which I have a problem with. For some reason, this one just doesn't strike me just because I feel like it's not going to be too competitive. I feel like it's pretty much an, a given that uh, Ty is going to go over pretty strong. But Kira Hogan impressed me last week, so I'm excited to see what she can do. I feel like it's time to really at least let her showcase. My question to you is if they announce Johnny Impact, on this pay-per-view at all because this that's the thing i don't understand no dude i was thinking that they were gonna factor him and congo kong into the show somehow but then i was like okay well they get him and ty get married the day after 
which I don't think that makes any sense on a Monday, but I think she said they get married the next day. So I'm not even sure they're going to do the tapings. So I was thinking, okay, well, they're not going to do the pay-per-view and now Ty is doing the pay-per-view, but that that's really odd. Not having Johnny impact on there. It, it's got, it has yeah. to be something personal, like due to the wedding it has to be. Yeah. It, it makes literally no sense. I mean, it's been one of the strongest featured guys on impact and they're pushing Congo Kong hard. Uh, I mean, I don't want to give away spoilers since you haven't seen the show, but they had a match on Thursday, but it wasn't really a match. And, you know, you would think that they want to give Johnny a shot. If, I don't even know how they get it. If they don't do the tapings, I mean, that's going to be at least a few, like a month of it not showing. Maybe that's the way they wrote him off, but I just expected him, of anyone, to be on this pay-per-view. What have you thought about Johnny Impact so far? I, I know he came last year, but here we are in 2018, and... I always say in my podcast that it's a matter of time till he's the world champion. They've they're they're trying to do that underdog thing with him where he keeps being the number one contender, and then he's even put the number one contendership on the line a couple times. He, he did against um, man, I want to say against maybe low key one time against KM and against someone else. So and then he keeps coming up short. Like, what have you thought about him so far in the company? Because I I felt like his promos have been so cheesy that it really takes away from like the overall impact that he could have on the company. I mean, I'm glad he's here, but it's not like really working for me. You pretty much just hit the the nail on the head for me, man. Like even for years after, basically after John Morrison was done in WWE, I was hoping TNA or impact would get the guy. Um, and he's, he's someone I've always wanted to see in the company. He's a man, the stuff that this guy can do, the acrobatic shit, like it's, it's unreal. Uh, you know, he's a, like the guy is, just, he's a star from head to toe. Just from the looks of him. I mean, he's a good looking man. He's called Johnny Gorgeous for a reason, you know, <laughs> but, uh, man, it's just the underdog thing. It, it's worked. I did. I hated the fact that he came in and, and basically they pushed him right to the top, the main event down for glory. Cause I felt it should have been Stormer EC3. Um, and, and that kind of started to rub me the wrong way. It's not that he gets Johnny, but like impact management were kind of making me upset about it. Cause I don't feel like they pushed him cause he was, for any reason other than the fact that John Morrison from the WWE was somewhat recognizable, but um, he's had some fantastic matches. I feel like I was, I've actually been kind of thinking about this. It just seems like they haven't pulled the trigger on him being the champion yet, but it seems like it's got to happen at some point. But then it, you look at it, it's like, well, Moose has got to get the, the title at 1.2. Um, but his promos, man, have just been so God awful. They're cheesy. The whole slam town thing. He just doesn't, it just, I think he's trying. It's just he's not a good actor, Do, and, which is odd because he's an act like <laughs> tries to right? act. Yeah. yeah. Did you I ever saw him in some movie on TNT at one point? Did you ever watch when him, uh, him and the Miz used to do like the dirt sheet that little web show years ago? I know you stopped. You know, obviously, we both stopped watching, but I think that might have been from a period that you may have still been watching. Yeah, it was. I, I stopped watching in 2012, which I would say was a year too late. But I, I, I always remember them as a team, and I would watch them on whatever Raw or SmackDown brand it was. But I actually never watched that Dirt Sheet show or whatever it was called. Oh, it was gold. It, it was the first was it? time. Yeah, it was the first time anyone really did any kind of web show or, or whatever. And he was a star of that. Like he used to always say, uh, "What the hell was his name? John Morrison there, or John?" Yeah, John yeah. Morrison. After it was Johnny or Johnny Nitro, then he went to John Morrison. But he would he would always give a fact about himself. So you know he'd be like, um, "I'm John Morrison, and I'm the one who taught Madonna to speak in a British accent, or some shit like that." He he just always had like this random ass fact about himself. And uh, the Miz used to be like, "I'm the Miz," you know. But I always thought he sounded like yeah. an idiot. But Morrison always had, and it sounded so idiot. cool. So it's just crazy. Like now, fast forward. He's just so bad when I felt like he was ahead of the curve, but. And I've heard people, oh, I'm sorry to cut you out, man. I was just going to say, I've heard people that watch, and I think you do watch Lucha Underground, don't you? Yeah, a little bit. I, I don't, um, not on a regular basis, but when I can watch it, when I can catch it, I do. Cause I've heard people say that Johnny Mundo cuts like the best heel promo in the business and stuff. And it's just, it, it, I, don't, I don't know if it's like, it's so hard for him to go from, you know, the heel promos to the, to the fake ones now, but I feel like the guy who needs a heel turn really bad. Oh, he does. He does in the worst way. Um, hopefully, yeah. they can <laughs> figure out a way. Right. I feel like once he gets that heel turn, that's when he's going to be champ. 
Yeah, very possible. Because you're right, Moose Moose has to hold the title this year too at some point, and then I would imagine Eli is going to get it back. So we might the world title might be jumping around this year. We'll see. Uh, the company tried something new this year, and so far they've had the most solid ratings that they've had since being on Pop TV. So each week they send out a survey and poll the fans who they like seeing who they want to see more of. And sometimes it's ridiculous because it'll be like the feast or fired episode. EC three has gone and EC three is on there. Like, do you want to see more of EC three? I mean, it's, it's so ridiculous sometimes, but um, you know, they talk about that favorite segments, what they would do differently. So they're giving the chance, the fans an opportunity. Cause what Don Callis said is like, we're getting free advice from the fans, you know, to an extent, we're not going to do everything they say, but it's like free advice. So now we, we, we have actually yet to see them, how they implement these things because this has been the same set of tapings and everything, but I think it's a pretty good strategy to get people involved. Have you been uh, filling out the surveys and all that? I've done them a couple of times, man. I, like I'm not, I guess I don't get on the right place, like website or wherever it is that I actually give them out each week. Uh, I've just kind of stumbled across them a couple of times. Ironically, I just did one like a week or two ago. I think Griggs actually showed it to me. What? Uh, Griggs also a member of the HeelCast, but. All right. So you, so obviously you're not doing it too much. I do it every week, but. What do you think, um, what are some of the changes? So me, my big change is those GWN matches. You know, man, um, it sucks. I pay for it and I, and I will continue to do so because I want to give them my money and support, but I'm so busy all the damn time. Like I pay for global GWN, the global wrestling network, but I have only been able to watch it like a time or two. Uh, and I can't get it to show up on my like uh, fire stick TV. So I, I'll do the fight network thing, but the fight network is nowhere near as good. But uh, I haven't seen any of these exclusive matches at all, unfortunately. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about because those I actually do want to see. I know what you're talking about because, you know, um, I know during that set of tapings, like Kira Hogan and Sienna did a match and, and um, what's her name? Alicia did one. That's not what I mean. I meant the, um, like the throwback matches that they do on Impact. The, uh, those have been the things for me in the survey that I'm like, f fucking stop. Yeah, man, it totally is. Stop it. And, nor, and, and, you know, like, they did the one the one that's on this last day back in the show, Kurt Angle versus Bobby Roode. We know why you're doing it and what you're doing. And it's just you're trying to showcase that the guys in the WWE now used to be Impact first. Most of us know that. Um, you know, and it's just like I remember the years when you were a whole lot better. Quit, quit reminding me and just get there. But it, it takes away TV time. You know, when you think about people that could be doing be on TV more and get more showcase, you know, I mean, like, shit, I'll take more J Jimmy Jacobs. Uh, get to Chandler Park out of this Chandler Park gimmick and do something good with him because I hear that guy is fire. And, you know, we're supposed to get more new talent coming in. I just feel like you could better utilize a lot of people. We haven't seen Seattle on TV in forever. These matches things can go. Yeah, that was just due to her injury. But I'm getting really tired of just the the insistence on including – WWE guys into this stuff because like okay Bobby Roode was a great character he had been around from damn near the beginning he had the longest world title reign but they never it's been a while at the end of his reign or at the end of his run I should say that they really treated him like he was a big deal like they're treating him like a much bigger deal now that he's gone and they, they take any opportunity they can to show a Bobby Roode picture or a match or same with Eric Young, same with Samoa Joe. And it's getting like, it's getting really old. This is a strategy they've tried to do. It doesn't work. And I actually got really upset during the Hall of Fame ceremony. Then they started trying to show Jeff Jarrett stuff. I mean, they couldn't be more obvious in what they're doing. And had they not had that Hogan and Bischoff era where they were just trying to copy WWE, then maybe it wouldn't be that big of a deal now, dude. But for me, that bugs the freaking shit out of me. Like show amazing red once show, show me some fucking shit. That's not Mick Foley out there. That's not someone currently in WWE. And then I don't know. Like if you follow on impact every single day, they do like a throwback or a, I don't know what they call it, but it's like a, an old picture. It's, it's someone from the WWE every single day, dude. Is it? Oh my God. Yeah, it's a little bit different. Like, and here's the thing, too, man. If you want to do that shit, show me Petey Williams beating AJ Styles for the X Division Championship. <laughs> yes. Show someone that's great on your roster that needs to be featured more and look better, a.k.a. Petey Williams. Like, show some stuff like that. Petey and Sanjay have history. Uh, you know, maybe some old LAX stuff from, you know, when Conan Homicide, I, I, I hope it's still around at some point. I mean, show some of that stuff, too, you know. It's just, 
showcase what you have instead of what you used to have because we already know what you used to have and we want to see you get back there. So the social media numbers have gone up, however. Uh, 150K on Twitter, I've seen it go up since I got on Twitter a couple of years ago. So that's been going up. The YouTube numbers have gone up. Um, they've added another 300,000 subscribers since they hit the 1 million mark. And now we have the Twitch shows like Brace for Impact, Last Chancery, Impact versus LU, the One Night Only format where they've done Canadian Clash, the Oklahoma show, I don't remember what it was called, March Breakdown, Cali Combat's coming up, and along with the already established Pluto TV. So they're putting a really strong emphasis on the social media, the digital media. Have you been watching these shows, the the uh, Twitch shows and the One Night Onlys, now that we're just in this new format? I haven't, mainly because you know, I just don't have the time to. I watch the Lucha Underground versus Impact show live, of course. Um, but, you know, I think the concept for the one I don't is, is maybe a little bit better. Um, but they're still, you know, like they're they're relevant to the product really. But, you know, it's cool to actually see them go to house shows. And I think them just going to the house shows and like showing the impact talent, you know, to some some fans that may not, you know, be too keen on it or even know what it is. Uh, to just go to a local indie wrestling show. I mean, I, I think that's, that's the best benefit of it. But I just I haven't had the time to watch them. I would like to. I think well, I don't know about the one night only, but you know I, I'd like to see more content as much as I can. Well, actually, the one night onlys have been better than the uh, the Twitch shows mainly because the the production is a little bit better. But they're pretty good shows, man. Like, but they're house shows. The hard thing watching on Twitch is there's a chat box and they it's, it's heavily moderated, which is really a nice breath of fresh air for Impact because they don't moderate anything else. But people are always like. This is what impact impact has come to. This is the quality. I'm like, I get in there every time I get to freaking house show. They're not going to bring the television cameras and the television crew and the production team. I mean, it's so ridiculous, but you kind of got to get up, get away from thinking like that and just enjoy it for what it is. Cause it, it looks like a freaking house show, but they got more, they got more energy than the impact zone, obviously, but. When you get the opportunity, I know you're, I know you're a busy, busy guy. I mean, we've been sitting here trying to do this podcast, and I, I know how busy you are, but hopefully you get an idea, I mean, again, an opportunity. Th my whole thing, I actually think that it can help with a TV deal in the future, getting off Pop TV, because Pop TV's ratings, that's not going to get them off Pop TV. Like, they can't go to, I can't even think of a television channel, be like, hey, we're doing a 370K over Pop TV. They're not going to take them. But when you have these digital numbers... That's actually something that shows like more eyes on the product or whatever, but, but they've been Absolutely. doing, yeah, but they've, they've been doing a really good job on it. What have you, what have you thought about the overall wrestling so far this year? Cause they had like a tagline that it only lasted like a week or so. It was like less talk, more action or something along those lines. But I really felt from like the very top episode of the year under this regime that the, the wrestling has really stepped up because we're not really getting the the BS like three minute matches. Um, whoever's out there competing, we're usually getting like something good, like follow Bod's out there. And even though he's a comedy wrestler, he's still putting on a good show. And it seems like everything's been pretty competitive. So do you, do you like kind of agree that the wrestling has stepped up this year? Or do you think it's, that's kind of the same it's been? I think it stepped up drastically, man, at least from last year. Uh, you know, there was, yeah, like slam anniversary last year had a couple matches like that tag team match. And, uh, I thought the, the like the Scott Steiner and Josh Matthews match was awesome, um, but basically from then on out, other than like Eli Drake and uh, Johnny Impact, there wasn't a whole lot of really standout great matches. And this year, you know, there's there's definitely been a handful already. And and it's like back in the days, man, with TNA before, and, and I mean even a little bit with the Hogan and Bischoff years, they had these corny as terrible Vince Russo as storylines that uh, really hamper or like put the hell held the product back at times and i'm not saying all vince russo stuff was bad because a lot of it was good too but that kind of prevented it that and like jared hogging the tell the world title all the time it was kind of what held the product back so but what what stood out from it was just the wrestling was fantastic the wrestling was kicking the shit out of wwe the x division everyone in there could work like you had such a great mixture of talent from top to bottom uh, and then you, know, you throw on these women that can wrestle for the first time ever. You're not seeing a bunch of like terrible, you know, like, hot divas that can't wrestle for shit. <laughs> so, and, and it's like impact has since really John Gabriel took over has went completely away from like putting on like, 
you know, the highest of quality of wrestling matches. And they're probably out of the five companies or whatever, by far number five. And that, that sucks. So I'm glad to see them going, getting back to that. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of people that can, you know, have a great match with anybody. But, you know, you got Moose, you got Eddie Edwards out there that uh, those two for sure can do it. Uh, and, and, you know, Austin Aries can with anyone, Seidel, Johnny Impact. There's a, and Rosemary, you know, I mean, there's a lot on the roster and it's, it's time to showcase them. So I'm, I'm about as happy as this as I can possibly be. Yeah, um, I, I, even the match with, like, it was Phantasma and Braxton Sutter from a few weeks ago. It was like, it was still a good match. I mean, every time we get someone out there, it's it's semi-competitive. And that's that's what I always, because I go to a lot of indie shows, and that's the magic of indie wrestling, is every time two people go out there, you just know you're, you know you're going to get, like, a competitive match. So they've really stepped it up. But do you think, like, they've, they've taken, like, a seat back in the – because you've talked about the Russo storylines on that show. Do you think they've taken like a step back on the creative side, though? Do you think they're like focusing more too much on wrestling? Because I don't, I don't know exactly my opinion on that. I mean, what they're doing with Sammy and Eddie has been amazing, but um, you know they're doing less vignettes, more less, you know, just less talking in general. And I almost feel like it's. I don't want them to go like the Ring of Honor direction. You know what I mean? Where it's just like just wrestling. Yeah, I don't want that. I don't want them to be like Ring of Honor at all either, but. I feel like they've probably got the right balance, to be honest. I mean, have they taken a step back with creative? Yeah, but I wanted them to take a step back with creative, if that makes sense. I mean, nothing really over the top or stupid is, is coming off on a storyline. I haven't seen anything just too bad on TV. And, you know, like, let's just be honest, man. Pro wrestlers are wrestlers. A lot of them, I mean, there's a small handful that can act, but most of them cannot. I mean, like, The Rock, John Cena, Rosemary, you know, they, they can act. But, uh most wrestlers can. Some of these promos are going to come off terrible. I mean, and they're realistic stuff, you know, like I want the, the, the storylines and stuff to revolve around what's going on. I want the wrestling to dictate the storylines, not the other way around. And, and I think that's kind of been the best part. I mean, we have KM doing some fat shaming or whatever, like who cares, but it's realistic. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude, I actually think that body shaming angle really isn't bad because it's actually, you know, I don't want to compare this to the attitude era by any stretch. Don't, don't get me wrong, but what made the Attitude Era magical is that they they tied it into real life instead of just trying to create their own storylines. Like that body shaming thing is actually something that <laughs> is going on. I don't think it's that bad. Obviously, Tyrus is gone now, so I don't know what the hell they're gonna do with that. But hopefully, scrap it. I wasn't I wasn't looking forward to seeing that at all. I uh, actually in that heel cash chat, man, we were talking about the card, and I was like, I'm gonna be pissed off if I have to sit there and watch like Falaba and Tyrus take on like Conley and. Uh, cam or something because it's just it's it's I, I actually i have no problem with the fat guy tag team the natural disasters were weren't too bad i just had a problem with tyrus sucking and they don't want to see him at all <laughs> well now you don't have to worry about that anymore i i think they're still getting their feet wet with creative like the main storylines have been focusing on eddie obe congo kong and abyss trying to establish ali and then of course trying to introduce aries and hitching a company to his back for a little while so they've got their own fair share of what they're working on yeah, no doubt. And before we, you know, like we move on, BQ, there's a couple things I wanted to bring up, especially one thing that I want to make sure gets the praise that it deserves. Uh, and you mentioned earlier, but I mean, look, we've seen Ali kind of, you know, she's stepping up, getting away from that kind of rookie thing, which I feel they need to do because, you know, it's kind of like Cherry Bomb go out there and do the stuff that she does. Uh, I think the belt collector thing that Austin Aries is doing is really cool. Um, you know, it's, it's like, the, you know, like the new age Ultimo Dragon in a way. But this dude's going out and coming out with all these belts. I don't want to see our world champion lose to the Ring of Honor television champion, whatever, whatever's going to happen there. But um, the best storyline, this, this, I've been so down on the guy since he came in. Now I'm 100% behind this guy, and this is the hottest feud I've seen in years and years. And that, I'm talking any company. And that's what's transpired from a big accident with Sammy Callahan and Eddie Edwards. This... Dude, like, I, I hated Sammy Callahan. I was like, the guy looks gross and dirty. He just comes out and he, he yells every time he talks. It's senseless. It's stupid. This dude is, like, flipped a 180. It was an accident and it sucked, but the way that they played this out, man, this is the best feud I've seen in a long time. That match that they did at the uh, Impact versus Lucha Underground, they did that absolutely perfect. It actually still stood up going into the pay-per-view, but that was just perfectly done. Uh, the only criticism I had is I, I feel like Alicia maybe should have thrown in the towel instead of uh, Cyrus, but agreed. Man, I, yeah, uh, dude, this is this is so hot. 
And I wish that, and it sucks because they got to stop this TV taping for so long because the way this thing has took off, this, this should not be the match of the pay-per-view. It should be like last man standing, Sammy Callahan against Eddie Edwards, not the six-man tag. And I feel like that kind of bit him in the ass. But it, are, are you feeling this like the way I, that I am? Because I'm just, man, I've been blown away. Oh my God, dude, they're killing it. Like when they did the the hotel one, I was like, I was on the edge of my seat every time they did it. The only thing I didn't like is when he dressed up like the maid. And then I was like, what is the point of that? Because he still got Eddie's attention. Like I thought he was trying to like kidnap Alicia or he didn't even use that to sneak attack him. So that was the only thing that kind of bugged me a little bit, but they're absolutely killing it. And I agree because I said the same thing on our review. I was like, or in our preview for redemption, I was like, why are they doing this six man match? Like he needs to get his come up in, in a one-on-one -on -one encounter. So it actually makes me think OVE could possibly win that match. And then they just extend the feud. Cause there's, I don't know that the safe money is saying Eddie and his team win, but to me, that's not really like the come up for me. I don't know, but, but they're killing it. And, and you're right. Like they, they took something that happened by accident that made absolute gold with it. I, I mean, They've they've been damn near perfect with it, dude. They have, man. And you know, like I don't I feel like regardless if whoever wins that six band tag at redemption, I don't feel like it's gonna be the thing in the feud. I feel like they're definitely maybe they can drag it off to slam anniversary, but I feel like they're they're gonna do the blow off match on this taping. Uh maybe two more of them, but um man the the other thing I wanna bring up with Sammy Callahan. And, like, I've got some columns out there on the internet and all that. Just, I've, I've missed – I loved Brian Pillman when he was doing his thing, man. It was just so wild and out there, and it was just – no one else had done it. But – and I, I kind of wanted, like, someone else to come in and be that Brian Pillman, or we need another Brian Pillman. And I almost feel like maybe Callahan has, has kind of taken that over. Uh, I mean, that, that whole Booker Man thing with Don Callis, I mean, if anyone that remembers, uh, you know, when Brian Pillman was out there wrestling Kevin Sullivan and just went on a shoot – started really actually shooting with him, left, grabbed the mic and said, I respect you, Booker Man, and then just walks off. There's that. And then over this weekend, so Kevin Sullivan, the same guy, man, so Callahan bashes him in the head with a baseball bat, and then you see the pictures online, and he's got like a fucking golf ball coming out of his head, and it's just like, it makes me wonder what the hell is going on. Like, I'm, I'm was this an accident? Was Kevin Sullivan like, do it, hit me in the fucking head with a bat and kill me? Dude, I just saw the picture. I don't know what really happened with that. And I haven't even looked up, looked at it, but he had a freaking goose egg like a mother. Yeah. I actually, you know, now that I think about it, I don't, I'm not sure that it was a bat. Like, I think that's what I was originally told, but I think like he just threw a chair and Kevin Sullivan didn't like protect himself or anything. And that's what did it. But I mean, the, it worries me that Callahan's going to get this reputation as, as an unsafe worker, but the, mis the mystique and the mystery of this guy is growing. Don't you feel like he took OVE to the next level too? Because OVE, dude, f five months ago, we're like, get these guys off television. I still feel get these guys off television. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, he's, he's definitely elevated them. People on Impact Asylum were, were hyping up OVE for years and years before they made their debut. And they came on and it's like, this was it. Well, you know, I was familiar with the guys. Um, and I think they could be a lot bigger if they bring their sister out and bring Jessica Havoc and everything. I think they could have like a really legit stable, but I was familiar with those guys and they kind of feel, cause I always say, dude, I think impact needs more indie darlings. Um, because those indie darlings really can kind of put butts in seats more than just bringing in talented wrestlers. And, uh, I thought OVE was going to kind of be some of the first ones to do that. And I was familiar with them and their work and everything, but they just weren't TV ready. I think is were really what it boiled down to. They came out and their promos freaking sucked. I mean, they freaking sucked and they don't even talk anymore. <laughs> Sammy literally does all the talking. And, uh, I think that was, I think it was really honestly just the presentation. And then I, I think also the way they just kind of tried to thrust them into the title picture. Yeah, I think that was part of it too. So and they won I don't the think it's, oh, sorry, yeah, I mean, they, they interrupt you. yeah, no. And then they won the belts. And people are like, seriously? Um, I think it was just a presentation, and I think they kind of slid him into the Reno scum spot. And uh, instead of really introducing us like they needed to, they just, I think the company did a disservice. And then they when they debuted, they, uh, they, they had like a 50-50 match with the jobbers. 
Do you remember that? Like they got just as the jobbers just got it, got uh, just as much offense in as they did. Yeah, man. I actually, that's what going through my mind the whole time we've been talking. And I, I wasn't sure like if I found a spot to mention or if it was that relevant or not, but those jobbers impressed me more than them. That match. And I'm not, I know I'm not the only person that said that. I, I've actually read comments on a style saying that. I, I think a couple of the guys that did the heel cast actually agreed and said the same thing. Um, they just, man, it, it just, they did not impress at all. It was like the genre that came just running out of nowhere and fucking hit was, was the most impressive thing. And then, you know, like I was, when they won the belt, reading it on T, like reading the spoilers, I wasn't happy about it. But then, like, uh, I, I called it right before we heading to Battle for Glory. I'm like, LAX is going to be the one getting the cheers. Not not OBE, and then you know they did do the turn, but they just the way that they threw them out there and everything, it just it failed. So how do you think LAX has been in 2018? They've um they've stayed the course, like they they now that they're baby faces, they haven't been watered down or anything. They're they're pretty much the same exact team. But we were talking about this on our redemption preview. Is I think the only flaw to LAX and it's not even their fault is that they fed them every single possible tag team as quick as possible you know and they never they weren't having like long feuds I mean I guess the OVE one was kind of long but what are your thoughts right now on LAX like do you think the baby face thing is working because you can't really go heel with them at this point no you can't man that I think that they legitimize themselves in, in a weak tag team division legitimize themselves as a really elite tag team anywhere uh, and, and that's been, been awesome. Uh, I feel like there needs to be more of LAX. I, and I want to see more Diamante. I hope like she is recovered and can be back. I want to see more Homicide. But you say that they went through every tag team out there, which is true, although I keep petitioning all the time, Petey Williams and Sanjay Dutt as a tag team, uh, to let them do their thing. But, yeah, man, like, Impact needs tag teams more than absolutely anything. And that's been that way for Case. And ironically... This, you know, back in the uh, 2006 or 2009 or 10, actually, like, back to 2004, man, like, this is legitimately one of the, TNA Wrestling had one of the best tag team divisions in any company's history ever. And, and to see that there's nothing now that kind of sucks, actually, it really sucks. But, yeah, man, there's just, who is left for them to feud with? I, I mean, there's not going to be a classic match at Redemption, but it's Eli Drake and Scott Steiner. I mean, that, it's going to be money. But uh, they need more opponents for LAX really bad. I hope this like Lucha Underground thing I uh, can produce some of that. But they're they're hot. I feel like their flame has died out a lot though. Because uh, man, like LAX is probably the hottest thing in Impact for a while. And then after this set of taping, it just doesn't seem like LAX has the you know the feel that they used to have. What kind of killed them was last year they did the very unnecessary Global Force Wrestling Tag Team Tournament title tournament. And um, at that point, you know, they faced Veterans of War and they faced uh, uh, Laredo Kid and Garza. So at that point, they knocked out the other all the tag teams in in, in a matter of like three weeks on that show. And then uh, I, they, I, from talking to Adam Thorne still, like they were they were trying to build towards them having something with Reno Scum, and then that didn't happen. Then they get OVE, and now top of year, like they could have done something with Cult of Lee next set of tapings, but they already you know, ran through those guys. So I don't know. They, I agree, man. They're, they're the hottest things going, but it's like the the tag team division is so bad. Like LAX could ultimately suffer if they don't freaking give them, give them something, someone to work with in Canada. They like debut that tag team for like one episode. I don't even call it a debut, but do you remember they brought the two Canadian dudes out and the guys got offense on LAX and then we never saw them again. Yeah. They were too bad. That's, didn't they like have a match with OVE too? And instead of like a, I actually felt like there was going to be a split off feud and they would feud with OVE or something, but that failed. But, you know, those guys were right. They were over a little bit. Um, and I thought I heard rumors that Reno Scum was going to come back, but it just, they, they've got to do something with it, man. They like, pair some people together. Um, you know, Andrew Everett's coming back. I mean, maybe Everett and Conley or Everett and Lee, because that, that Cult of Lee feud with LAX was something I was really looking forward to. And it, it you know, it had, it's, it, Ran its course. They had that match. Like, what was that show called that they did? Like the Impact TV special, um, Crossroads. Yeah. And you know that was that. Uh, and I feel like that would be a pay per view quality match. It's just, you know, they got to do something. I'm trying to like think off the top of my head, like two can they pair together? If Jimmy Jacobs would actually wrestle, I mean, him with uh, Kongo Kong might be all right. I feel like Jimmy Jacobs should create a stable. 
Uh, yeah, and what was the other one I was just thinking of? It's actually like more of a faith thing. I mean, like pairing like Fala Ba with someone other than uh, Dick Justice. I mean, someone else is kind of fat on the roster. I'm trying to think of who that is now because I was just fat out, got off the sinking ship apparently. <laughs> but you know, oh, yeah, Kong Kong. Never mind. You know, I, I kind of consider uh, Thornstow and Hakeem Zane like semi friends of mine at this point. I talk to them quite a bit. So the whole with Reno Scum, I talked to him a little bit about it. I told him I don't want to pry too much because I try not to get into too much business. But he said he said nothing's on paper yet. So I think they're in talks. But you know, they did the house show with him, and uh, I know that he wants to come back. I think they need him to come back. Um, regardless of what someone thinks about, you know, three notes come, they need him. And then regarding like with Hakeem Zane and, uh, and as Rohi Ryu, the Desi hit squad, like, we, I don't even know what's going on with that. And, and honestly, from my conversations with him, he's not really sure either. That's great. Like, yeah. He, he, he doesn't even know when they're debuting and they've been doing the Twitch shows, him and Gerson are Singh. Um, they've, they've wrestled on Twitch and one night only together, but the presentation of them is way off right now because he he's continuing to wrestle on impact under a new name. They didn't re re debut him or anything. So I feel like the potentials there for Reno scum for, for the, uh, the hit squad and, and whoever else, but LAX is LAX is really going to hurt if they don't figure this out. Um, so I want to transition real quick. So they've had a lot of wrestlers leave EC three, Lashley storm, and uh, to to your point earlier, I actually thought Storm and EC3 should have main evented. Uh, not, no, actually, I meant to say I thought Storm and Eli Drake should have main, main evented Bound for Glory instead of Impact and uh, Eli Drake. But and then LVN is gone. They had to get the title off her instead of taping. So we've we've seen Brian Cage and Sue Young debut. So what do you got? What do you think so far on these guys? So real quick for me personally, Brian Cage. He's doing some really impressive things, but I think he was doing some badass shit in those two matches against Lashley, and the crowd was giving him zero. I mean, he was super, super plexing. He was d jumping over the top rope. He was doing her Karanas, and the crowd was giving him nothing. And I don't know if it's because they were so behind Lashley or, or if they felt like Cage is getting shoved down their throat a little bit. And then Sue Young, she's I, I'm really impressed with her. So I think she's great, but what do you... What do you think of right now on, on Cage and, and Sue Young? Well, I mean, I remember Cage when he did, like, uh, what was it, the gut check trial for, for TNA back in the days. I mean, mm -hmm. he, can, he can do a lot more than what he's doing, like, more style. And I think we'll probably see that because he's in, like, an X Division match Sunday. I, I've wanted the guy to get a full-time contract in Impact for a long time. Same with Jack Evans is not a free agent, hit, hit. But, um... I mean, he's been impressive, man. I didn't know that they would really push him this hard. I mean, I don't know that I'd like to see him destroy EC3. I mean, you know, Lashley really legitimately passed the torch of the guy. And you're right. I mean, what was the reaction there? Whether the impact crowd was behind him or not, it's not going to portray that way on television. And so, um, but I mean, he, he's been awesome. I've enjoyed it. I think him and Lashley have had two really good matches. And, and I'm happy he's there. I just, I, I feel like maybe they're pushing him a little too hard. Uh, I mean, he did beat Eli Drake you know, one-on-one, -on -one. uh, who's his former tag team partner, apparently, too, but, you know, it's like, he's already, like, kind of just ran through everyone, and I also feel like this, this X Division match, it's like, what's the point in it? Just to show that uh, he can do that kind of style with everyone else, because we're expecting him to just toss these other guys around. That's what I think, too. I think I think it's just going to be, like, him bulldozing through the X Division, and them looking bad at his expense. And, I mean, they've, they've made the X Division look bad enough as it is over the years. Last year, they kind of started to build it back up a little bit. But I think, and you know, I, that's why I'm hoping, like, with Scott Yamore there, who, who was with TNA at the start, uh, and, and Don Callis, who just knows things, I'm really hoping that they realize and remember what the X Division was to this company and try and get that back. I mean, I'm ex I, love fa I love seeing Phantasma wrestle, uh, having Desmond come back, DJ Z finally back. I mean, that's I'm excited to see that. But uh, I just, I mean, with Cage, I feel like they're pushing him too hard, too fast, and I just slow your roll a little bit. I totally agree, dude. So I'm worried that it doesn't pan out the way they think it's gonna going to. Uh, what do you think about Sue Young and then as a new knockout? Uh, so I remember when Rosemary made her debut, and the tapings were going on, and people on Impact Asylum were trying to figure out exactly who it was. It was Daphne. 
after Daphne got shut down, everyone was saying it's too young, it's too young, it's too young, until they found out it was Courtney Rush. Um, Asian Rosemary, pretty much the, the thing that she is there. I guess I, I've been impressed with her presentation too, but at the same time, I feel like we have two of the exact same out there almost. Um, I think her and Rosemary, when when that stuff happens, is going to be good. Uh, it, you know, this will probably be, be a good match. I mean, with Sutter's involvement, it's actually kind of getting Braxton Sutter over a little bit. Uh, I guess the, the jury's still kind of out because I haven't seen her wrestle too much, and I feel like we'll get uh, a better glimpse of that Sunday. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle there. Yeah, she, she's a... Uh... She'll get there, but I think she's another one that's getting fed to us a little too quickly in the sense that, like, what has she done to get a title match at Redemption? I mean, <laughs> she's had one match yeah. one, you know, and then a tag match and then a kind of match with Allie. So, so after this pay-per-view Redemption, we're getting a, another set of Orlando tapings, which I believe is going to cover eight weeks of television. So I think they were trying to cover four less episodes this time around. And then they're going to do 48 hours uh, of tapings in Canada, which will cover a month in uh, Windsor, Ontario. And this should be cool. So they did a Twitch. It was either one night only a Twitch in, in a, for this exact crowd. And this crowd was hot through the entire thing. Like they didn't die off by the main event or anything. So I think, I think, I think you're going to like this uh, when it happens. This should be um, really cool. So last thing I want to talk about is uh, – the Alberto El Patron situation. So this kind of happened top of the year. I mean, top of the quarter, not so much end of this quarter, but it's a good way to end the show and everything. But uh, I've already talked in pretty great links on the channel about it. You know, the guy issued a statement and he didn't take any kind of responsibility whatsoever. Try to say, you know, oh, well, we ha we're having a bad relationship. Like, dude, just a few months ago, you said that the suspension was your idea. And um, he j he takes no responsibility whatsoever. But what have been your thoughts on a uh, on that and everything? And it was crazy for me because I just I was there in person for that freaking redemption press conference. Like I was the right there. I took a picture with the dude. Like I literally saw him a handful of hours before he no showed. I guess you know, like I was surprised, but I guess I wasn't surprised. You know, when he when he first came on. When we knew we were signing, you know, uh, a lot of us on the Hillcast, Chef and myself in particular, were saying, you know, like, the dude's talented. I don't think he's as good as they say, but, you know, like, he's got no loyalty. He's got, you know, a lot of issues going on. And, you know, all the stuff, all the baggage that came with him, it, it's hard to trust the guy. And, you know, he comes out there and, you know, they're pushing him way too hard, which really pissed me off. Hated seeing how hard they pushed him the way that they did. And then, you know, but he was winning me over because after the show would go off, he'd be like, fuck WWE to everyone. Uh, and then, you know, like he comes back, has that bizarre shit at uh, Bound for Glory with Jeremy Borash. And then it's like they're pushing the guy again, and I feel like it's obvious that he's going over on, on Aries at this pay-per-view. And then the dude no-shows. And, you know, like they announced it on TV right before that match starts. And, and I'm thinking, like, great, what happened now? What, what did Alberto do? And, you know, I see everyone on Twitter like, oh, no, it's, it's a work, it's a work. And I'm thinking, it's not a fucking work, because if it was a work, he'd show up and cost them on the mat. Like, there's, there's issues with this guy. And, you know, it's exactly what uh, I was worried about happening. And I feel like you guys, I, I feel, you know, like from my past experiences, because issues that I've had personally in the past, uh, I, I think there's some addiction problems there with the guy, to be honest. Um, and uh, he just, the dude's spinning out of control. And it was just super unprofessional. His, his, how many family emergencies can this guy actually have? Because I, I feel like I've heard him use that excuse multiple times. It's the number one excuse people use whenever they need an excuse. And what I was saying on my channel, like, it, it's legitimate to, to not show up to work for a family emergency, but you can't just not show up and not call. Like, that's, that's not... That's not okay at all. It, in in no, no world and no job is it okay to just man, something happened. So I'm, I'm just not going to show up. I'm not going to follow up. I'm not going to do anything like get over yourself, dude. That's, that's, it's not how it works. Your family can be a priority, but you can still be like professional too. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, especially the family emergency happened to happen after there's video of you being recorded earlier that night with the Savio Vega and Carlito being shit hammered as fuck. Like he was, he was plastered and you know, it's, it's 
uh, Wrestling Robert, who does the show, that's actually one of his boys recorded the video that went out. Uh, it was at WrestleCon. And it's like, obviously, Alberto was beyond intoxicated. That clearly had something to do with it. I feel like he got too drunk and no-showed. Uh, you know, kind of like the Jeff Hardy thing, but Jeff Hardy actually showed up that night. I had shit on pills and got hit by Sting in, a, what, like 30 seconds or so? I mean, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's the dude's just, it's a joke. I don't think he's anywhere near as good as, as he comes off. Like, I feel like he was forced down my throat in WWE. He was actually one of the main reasons why I was getting really fed up with WWE. Me too. But, uh, I mean, they just, the dude just, he, it's like, he ripped off Carlito, Ted DiBiase, JBL, and Razor Mill, like, just ripped off what they were and just kind of made it into <laughs> one. Uh, and, you know, WWE is just cramming this guy down their throat because they're trying to actually get, you know, and uh, they're trying to appeal to a certain, you know, uh, demographic. Demographic, they, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they had lost Eddie. Chavo's not going to do it. Mysterio's kind of winding down. Uh, and, you know, but then he, the racist stuff comes out, uh, so he slaps the guy because of it. He goes and the shit that he did in Ring of Honor with Jay Lethal and the stuff that I would see in Lucha Underground, those promos, I was like, this dude's fire. He came to Impact after WWE again, and he was, he was never that guy. No, I, I thought he was doing some pretty good work for the most part, but then I agree. Like, he was one of the reasons... I, I started getting really bored with WWE at one point. Um, you know, I used to work the nights of those shows, and then whenever his show came on, I mean, his match, I always fast-forwarded through it with my DVR because I'm just like, dude, he's just doing the same shit, talking the same shit. I couldn't stand him over there. could not stand him. He was like my least favorite wrestler. And when he came to Impact, like, I don't know, I really popped for him because I was there when he debuted. And I, I've often said it's unfortunate that they botched the debut because if they would have got that um, organically, it, it was really, really good. But they had to redo it. But the oh, place okay. went the <laughs> the place went nuts for him. But um, I, I really liked what he was doing prior to the suspension, and then when he came back, I didn't like it. And he was a heel, but he was he, on dude, on Twitch. He had a show. He had a match with Moose where he came through the crowd. Like he was freaking Roman Reigns or something damn near. And I'm just like, aren't you a heel dude? Like, what are you just always playing fucking up to the crowd? And I don't know. He he definitely thinks he's a lot better than he is. And I noticed that too. On, and it was a televised match on impact, but I remember watching it and I thought, wait, is, is Alberto no longer a heel? Cause it didn't come off that way. I actually feel that the moose match, like cause they showed him and moose at a couple house shows. And I kept seeing it advertised. My my thoughts on that was that they were getting it down to where these two were going to put on a great match, get the chemistry together, and that was going to main event bound for glory. But obviously that won't be that won't be the case now. Um, I can't say I'm going to miss the guy. To be honest, I, he was doing some good stuff from time to time, but it's just you know I'm fuck him. I, I, it's it's hard man to just you know get behind this guy because he's so unprofessional. He's done this you know two times now, and we're you know. How many indie companies did he know show? Like, he know showed one, one event for, like, getting in a fist fight with his brother and ended up in jail or something like that, didn't he? I don't... I can't even keep up with his bullshit anymore. Yeah. It's just... It, it's unfortunate. I mean, from a human, human being perspective, I hope, you know, he gets his shit together. But, you know, it's just... Man. Stop burning these bridges. Because, you know, it's going to come to time that anyone... I guess that doesn't matter. WWE will take him back for literally anything. So, I mean, the other companies, I might get a little, you know, sick of it. And also, I mean, did you notice in WWE, it was like always him against the zero. They hardly have anyone else to feud with him. Yeah, they did a, they did a couple swagger programs too. But yeah, I just, uh, those are bring, those bring, those bring back bad memories, dude. I couldn't stand his matches there. Yeah, I just, yeah, I remember it was just like, he, he did, he was feeding with Mysterio. Like, I remember the match, because I'll always remember because Christian got his world title there in that ladder match after Edge. Uh, but then it was like, I saw him feed with Mysterio. I think Mysterio got hurt, and then Mysterio came back, and Alberto's feeding with him again, and it's just like, they kept going to that well, and it's like, why? Why not move on? Like, it just felt like, it, it, it almost felt racist. It's like, you just like, oh, Vince McMahon, oh, here's the two Hispanic guys. It was just like, come on, man. It, it's just the way they did it in the company just came off that way, and it just bothered me. That's yeah, repetitive. Terrible. And uh, I do I do have a question for you, though, BQ. We we brought we mentioned the people that came in, but dude, there's a long list of departures. Do you think that the uh, the departures are not being outweighed by by the new people that came in? Like, do you think there's enough that came in so far? Um, 
I don't know. Uh, obviously, you've got EC3, Lashley, Storm, LVN gone. You've got Austin Aries, Brian Cage, Sue Young who've come in. I would say it's kind of even at this point only because they allowed EC3 and Lashley to walk like they and Storm. Like they didn't negotiate with those guys. LVN was the only one who was just like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm turning in my two weeks. And obviously Jeremy Borash, which that's something we didn't talk about. He, um, I, I think he totally turned his back on the company. And the reason I say that is because he just one day said, Hey, um, I'm not coming to work tomorrow. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like he gave him some kind of notice to work with. And you would think someone who's been around the company since day one and seen so many people screw the company over to go to WWE. <laughs> like you would think he wouldn't do it that way, but he did. But I think it's been kind of even from a talent standpoint, but for the fans, the fans were so behind Lashley and EC3 and Storm and they're not behind uh, Cage and Sue Young like that yet. So I don't know. We're going to see what happens this set of tapings. If we get some really good surprises and everything, then I think those guys will kind of be in our rear view. But Storm is the one I miss, but I hope he gets the opportunity he's looking for. And I was getting a little bored with EC3 and then I'm going to miss Lashley too. I watched his uh, WWE debut online and he, he looked pretty happy to be there. So, you know, good for him. But uh, let's talk about that real quick before we wrap this up. Um, JB. So you kind of reminded me when you asked me that, but what'd you think about his departure and everything? Cause you know, just to go back to what I said, I really think if someone being around the company from day one, you would think he wouldn't do the, the, con the company like that. And he did. Yeah, you know, it, I'm glad you brought up JB because that was on my mind. I'm glad you just brought up James Storm because there's been something I've been itching to say here. Um, JB, it was, it was a shocker. Day one, Jeremy Borash, like he didn't leave last year when the Hardys tried to get him. And it was just so out of the blue. But you know what, man? I'm going to be 100% honest. I, I was so fucking happy when I found out Jeremy Borash was gone. Not that Sanjay and Josh Matthews are a dream team. But anything, literally, Sanjay Dunn is not very good at this, but it is so much better than listen to Borash and Josh Matthews give no emotion for anything, not for anything ever. This was literally becoming the worst commentary. Like, I was just getting pissed off at times because I'd watch a show and something big had happened and just be like, meh. And it's the it, worst. It, 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 I was so excited when JB first started doing commentary because like, JB has actually been good at it in the past. And it's like, finally, we'll get someone with some emotion. And it was just so fucking terrible. Just the worst pairing I think I've ever seen. And ironically, when you put Stryker and uh, Josh Matthews back together, you don't have Vince screaming in their ear the whole time. They were, were awesome at the Lucha Underground Impact Wrestling show. Yeah, I haven't seen it like that yet since I was there live and I haven't watched it. But I heard, I heard good things. But I agree, man. Like, um, I actually kind of dig Sanjay doing it. But he doesn't have the emotion, but he has some other things that work. But... Yeah, I was excited for JB too, and I was like, okay, you know, he's got a play-by-play -play type of voice, but it was awful. You're you're right, dude. It's the worst pairing ever. And sometimes when we watch the uh, the old matches on Impact, like when they showed Jade versus Rosemary, I actually thought when Jay when when Josh was the lead announcer with the Pope, like he had he had some emotion to him. You know what I mean? He spoke with a deeper voice, and he now he's like so concerned with trying to be funny. And he doesn't really know if he's a heel or a baby face. It just depends on that particular episode. So I don't mind it. But yeah, JB, I, it was kind of a blessing in disguise in that sense because the, the commentary was just a joke. It, it did none of the rest of any favor at all. Uh, yeah. Whether they were bickering back and forth or just no emotion, it did no favors. And I can't believe that people used to complain about the Pope. Pope was the MVP of 2017 in that booth by a lot. Um, but uh, the, the other thing, man, is the James Storm departure. Uh, I, I can't remember what it was, but someone had shown me a picture that him and Chris Harris won some tag team championships at uh, an indie show. And it's sad to see that that's happened. I, I feel like, you know, the WWE, they're blackballing James Storm because he left them to take better money, even though he said he'd never come back. They're taking Mahabali Shira and James Storm isn't there. I mean, give me a break. And, man, we've... James Storm is the one guy that every time he came out, he... he the impact zone gave him a, a pop. It doesn't matter where you're from. Everyone, like if all background nationality, whatever you're into, everyone came out and cheered for this redneck from Tennessee every time he'd come out. The guy was still over. He's deserved a, a world, real world championship reign for so long. And I feel like 
this Alberta money, they had, I guarantee they paid Alberta more than what they were paying James Storm. That Alberta money is up, man. James Storm, there's no reason, if NXT's not going to take him, there's absolutely no reason that James Storm should be just doing these shitty little indie shows and shouldn't be back where he belongs. He's our legend, the man should be in the Hall of Fame. I feel like this really needs to happen, and it needs to come back. Because, dude, look at our, our roster, like, they've, the misses, the people that have left, fucking Lashley, EC3, Rockstar Spuds, you know, from head, like, they've lost way too many good top-end people, and May 1st uh, was an extension from May 1st. That one really scares me. Are you talking about Eli Drake? Uh, yeah. It's, it, man, they cannot lose that guy. They, like, Austin Aries and Eli Drake, they need to build a company around, uh, but they cannot let Eli Drake go. They, I, I feel like those two, they just absolutely cannot let go, and they need to get someone like Storm back, someone with some sort of a name, because there's not much name value out there. But yeah, we've totally lost agree. So much of a name, uh, you know, name value. You know what I mean? At least for Impact Wrestling. Yeah, we're we're at a point now where they they literally have to build stars because they're just they're just not. And NXT is just signing people, just just to do it, whether they have a spot for them on TV or not. So they are to the point now they they are going to have to build stars because there's there's just not those free agents out there to do it with. But man, I think that's gonna do it for the show. We've been talking the first few months of uh. 2018 and then some we talked a little 2017 and, and things like that as it was a uh, as the as it tied in where it was relevant but hope you guys enjoy this and uh definitely check out the rav and uh his boys on the heel cast and um thanks for listening and we'll talk to you guys next time peace